Greetings, and welcome to the fifth lecture on the course, Introduction to Fourier Analysis. On the previous lecture, we completed our study of the L2 theory of Fourier series. We also saw one example of an easy result concerning the LP theory of Fourier series, namely that the Cesaro averages of the Fourier series of an LP function converge to that function in the LP norm. Even so, we have only scratched the surface on the general topic of the convergence of Fourier series. For example, do the Fourier series of an LP function converge in the standard sense, that is, without the need to resort to the Cesaro averages? We have only seen that this is true in the Hilbert space case, that is, when p is equal to 2. Another question which we haven't discussed at all is the question about the pointwise convergence of Fourier series. All the results we have had so far have stated that the Fourier series of a function in LP or in L2 converge to that function in the LP or the L2 norms. A priori, this says nothing about the question whether the Fourier series converge pointwise to the function. Many of these questions are quite deep, and all of them involve techniques which we don't have time to introduce in this course. Nevertheless, I want to give you a rough idea of what is known and true about these topics, and so skimming over the right answers is the plan for the first part of this lecture. Before getting started, however, let's have a brief recap of the notation. The letter capital T denotes the d-dimensional box of side length 2 pi centered at the origin. The notation LP of T stands for the space of complex valued Lebesgue measurable 2 pi periodic functions defined on RD, whose LP norm is finite. And the LP norm here is defined as an average integral over the box T when P is strictly less than infinity, and as an essential supremum of the absolute value of the function f when P is equal to infinity. Finally, the notation C of T stands for the space of continuous 2 pi periodic functions on RD. With this notation, the main accomplishment of the previous set of lecture notes was to show that if f is a function in L2 of t, then the Fourier series sum f hat n e n converges to the function f in L2 of t, and the Plancherel identity holds. The L2 norm of f squared equals the sum of the absolute value squared of all of the Fourier coefficients of f. In this result, the L2 convergence of the Fourier series means that the difference of f from its nth partial Fourier series tends to zero into L2 norm when n tends to infinity. This is basically all that we know at this point, and next, let's concretely state what we don't know. The first question concerns the pointwise convergence of Fourier series. Under which conditions on the function f can we guarantee that the nth partial Fourier series of f converges pointwise almost everywhere, or even everywhere, to f when n tends to infinity. And the second question concerns LP convergence of Fourier series. Is it true that if f is a function in LP of t, where p is not equal to 2, then the Fourier series of f converge to f in the LP norm? Concerning the question of pointwise convergence, let us start by stating the following simple proposition 2.0. Let f be a function in L1 of t, and assume that the sum of the absolute values of the Fourier coefficients is finite. Then the pointwise Fourier series of f, namely sum n in z to the power d, f hat n e to the power i n dot x, converges absolutely for every value of x in R d, and in fact defines a continuous 2 pi periodic function on R d. Moreover, the values of the L1 function f agree with this continuous function almost everywhere. The statement of proposition 2.0 is often abbreviated by saying that if f is an L1 function and the Fourier coefficients of f converge absolutely, then f is in fact a continuous function and agrees everywhere with its Fourier series. This version of the proposition would be easier to remember, but it's also a bit inaccurate. You should keep in mind that an L1 function is only defined almost everywhere, and the best you can hope to say about it is that it agrees almost everywhere with a continuous function. And this is exactly what Proposition 2.0 tells you. The proof of Proposition 2.0 is not difficult, and we leave it as an exercise. Next, we will state a deeper result on the subjects of LP and pointwise convergence. 
In doing so, we will restrict attention to the case of the ambient dimension d being 1. In higher dimensions, things get even more complicated. Results like the one we are about to see are still true, but only if the Fourier coefficients are summed in exactly the right order. For more information on this topic, just Google for summability of multidimensional trigonometric series. Finally, here is the one-dimensional result. Let p be an exponent which is strictly bigger than 1, and let f be a 2 pi periodic LP function on the real line. Then the Fourier series of f converges to f almost everywhere. Furthermore, if the exponent p is strictly less than infinity, then the convergence also holds in the LP norm. The final part concerning the LP convergence of Fourier series is not too difficult. It is based on a technique known as calderon sigmund theory. The pointwise convergence, on the other hand, is a very difficult problem. It was solved by Lennart Carleson in 1966 for the exponent p is equal to 2, and two years later by Richard Hunt for general exponents p. The technique behind the pointwise convergence result is known as time frequency analysis. One thing to observe about the theorem which we just stated is that we needed to assume that the exponent p is strictly bigger than 1, and this is not a coincidence. There is a counterexample due to Kolmogorov already from the 20s of a 2 pi periodic L1 function on the real line whose Fourier series diverges at every point on the interval from minus pi to pi. He also constructed an L1 function f whose Fourier series fails to converge to f in the L1 norm. So, in brief, assuming that f is an L1 function is not sufficient for any kind of convergence of Fourier series. If f is a continuous function, these problems are still not trivial. In fact, there is a continuous 2 pi periodic function on the real line whose Fourier series diverges at one point. Of course, continuous 2 pi periodic functions are bounded, and in particular in L2 of t, so it follows from Carleson's theorem mentioned above that their Fourier series converges almost everywhere. For this reason, it is already interesting to have an example of a continuous 2 pi periodic function whose Fourier series diverges at one point. If the continuity assumption is quantified, then the divergence issue goes away. For example, the Fourier series of Lipschitz continuous functions, or even Hölder continuous functions, converge at every point. This concludes our brief introduction to results concerning the pointwise and LP convergence of Fourier series. Our next section is entitled Smoothness and Decay of Fourier Coefficients. As you can see, there is a comma in the title after smoothness. So we are not going to talk about the smoothness of Fourier coefficients, but we are going to talk about the decay of Fourier coefficients of smooth functions. The main heuristic idea behind the results in this section will be that the Fourier coefficients of smooth functions tend to zero rapidly, and conversely, functions whose Fourier coefficients tend to zero rapidly enough are necessarily smooth. It turns out that we have already seen one basic result on the decay of Fourier coefficients. Namely, we have seen the Plancherel identity, which implies that if f is a function in L2 of t, then its Fourier coefficients are L2 summable. In particular, this forces the Fourier coefficients of L2 functions to tend to zero at infinity. Now, what if f is in L1 of t instead of L2 of t? Is the same conclusion still true? Do the Fourier coefficients of L1 functions tend to zero at infinity? Yes, they do, and this is known as the riemann lebesgue lemma. Let f be a function in L1 of t, then the Fourier coefficients of f tend to zero as n tends to infinity. The proof of the riemann lebesgue lemma is an excellent example of the power of approximation. If ever you need to prove a statement regarding LP functions, then try first proving it for continuous functions or even smooth functions. If you succeed at that, there is a good chance that you can approximate a more general LP function by these smooth functions or continuous functions, and then deduce whatever you wanted to prove for general LP functions. The riemann lebesgue lemma is a statement concerning L1 functions, and we have learned already in the previous lecture that L1 functions can be approximated in the L1 norm by trigonometric polynomials. 
Hence, we will first check that the riemann lebesgue lemma holds for trigonometric polynomials, and then simply deduce the general case of L1 functions by approximation. With this motivation in mind, let's first prove that the riemann lebesgue lemma holds for a fixed trigonometric polynomial P. Recall that by definition, a trigonometric polynomial is a finite linear combination of the complex exponential functions. In particular, our fixed polynomial P can be written as a sum over n ranges in Zd a n times e n, where only finitely many of the coefficients a n are non-zero. In other words, there is a natural number big N, so that all of the coefficients a n with indices absolute value of n larger than n are zero. With this notation, the Fourier coefficients of the polynomial P are precisely the numbers a n, and hence the Fourier coefficients of P vanish for all indices n whose absolute value exceeds the parameter big N. This certainly implies that the Fourier coefficients of P tend to zero as n tends to infinity, and hence the riemann lebesgue lemma holds for P. Next, let's consider a general 2 pi periodic L1 function f. By corollary 1.15 from the previous lecture notes, trigonometric polynomials are dense in the space L1 of t. So, given any positive epsilon, there exists a trigonometric polynomial p, so that the L1 norm of the difference f minus p is bounded by epsilon. To be perfectly honest, we only prove the density of trigonometric polynomials in L1 of t when the dimension of the ambient space d is equal to 1. This was only so because we did not want to start discussing higher dimensional Feyer kernels, and the density theorem still holds, as stated, in all dimensions. So, we take the higher dimensional approximation theorem for granted, and find the polynomial p at L1 distance epsilon from f. Now, since p is a trigonometric polynomial, we recall from the first part of the proof that the Fourier coefficients of p vanish for all large enough indices n say, when the absolute value of n exceeds big N. With this information in hand, it is easy to estimate the Fourier coefficients of f. Fix an index n whose absolute value is bigger than big N. Then the Fourier coefficient p hat of n is zero, and hence f hat of n equals f hat of n minus p hat of n. If we spell out the meaning of this difference explicitly, we find the difference between the average integral over t of fx times e to the power minus i n dot x dx and the average integral over t of px times e to the power minus i n dot x dx. Next, using the linearity of the integral and bringing the absolute values inside, we eventually find that the absolute value of f hat n is bounded by the average integral over t of the absolute value of fx minus px dx. But this expression is exactly the L1 norm of the difference between f and p, and the polynomial p was chosen so that this quantity is bounded by epsilon. Hence, we have shown that the absolute values of the Fourier coefficients of f are bounded by epsilon as soon as the absolute value of the index n is larger than the threshold big N. This means exactly that the Fourier coefficients of f tend to zero as n tends to infinity, and the proof of the riemann lebesgue lemma is complete. So, now we know that the Fourier coefficients of a 2 pi periodic L1 function tend to zero at some unspecified rate. In fact, it turns out that this rate can be as low as you wish. For any sequence of positive real numbers, cn, indexed by z, which tends to zero as n tends to infinity, it is possible to construct a 2 pi periodic L1 function on the real line whose Fourier coefficients decay slower to zero than the sequence Cn. For the details of this construction, see the book Classical Fourier Analysis by Grafakos. However, if the assumption that f is an L1 function is strengthened, and in particular we assume some smoothness of f, then the rate of decay of the Fourier coefficients to zero can be quantified. This will be the topic of the next lecture. This concludes the fifth lecture on the course Introduction to Fourier Analysis. Goodbye.